Let's analyze an example of having six questions on the exam out of which you shall answer three. There are some courseworks um, as an assessment for some universities, they don't even have exams, they have coursework. So you should know what kind of assessment you're going to have and prepare accordingly. So if you're going to have a coursework, then there is no need for you to prepare three topics or even uh, prepare it to answer in time because you will have plenty of time to answer your coursework. Uh, so, the pet, so please be aware of what kind of assessment you have before start uh, before adapting a, an appropriate strategy to it. So if it's an exam, it's a good practice for you to prepare few topics depending on how many questions you have to answer. So if you have to answer three questions, you could prepare like four topics just in case um, you get a question that you're not sure about and you have like one topic in reserve. As for public law, main topics that usually come up on exams is separation of powers, parliamentary sovereignty, considering Brexit, judicial, judicial review, rule of law. These are very important topics that you should know for public law examinations, whether it's a coursework or exams. So what, what is there to know about separation of powers? Three branches in the UK, there are, mm, the, the power is separated, there, there is not only one institution that makes all the decisions, but there are three, legislative, executive and judiciary. Well, a judiciary, it doesn't actually make the laws, but uh, the judges have the power to, uh, to change, interpret the law slightly differently than the parliament did. But actually, um, the, the objective of judiciary is that they in, uh, interpret the law as the parliament intended, but there are sometimes multiple interpretations as to what parliament intends. Uh, you need to focus on views of Montesquieu, Aristotle and Locke uh, and examples of overlaps. We have no, in our notes, we have very clearly now yeah, said what are the, these three views and uh, you can read that on this link here. Uh, and uh, the, the main, uh, ref, main act that you need to have a look is Constitutional Reform Act 2005. And now um, you need to also have a look at Brexit, which became the biggest uh, legal event of the um, British history probably of this century. So aim of this doctrine is to ensure the just distribution of power, protect individual liberties, promote efficiency and avoid abuse of power. Because if, if the, all the power was concentrated in just one institution, the likelihood of abuse of power would be a lot higher. That's why it's distributed among various institutions and many people. Then parliamentary sovereignty, uh, the notes on parliamentary sovereignty is accessible here, and I highly recommend you to read it. We have two types of notes. We have revision notes, which is shorter version, and we have longer version notes, which uh, you should read um, to learn, but revision notes is like just uh, to be able to review the main, main cases and main principles without actually diving in uh, too much reading. Uh, so about parliamentary sovereignty, uh, you need to know Dicey's three lean orthodox theory. According to Dicey, parliament can make or unmake any law on any subject matter, and the court must obey this. No parliament is bound by its predecessors or can bind its successors. And no body, including a court of law, can question the validity of an act of parliament. Dice's orthodox theory came into question with the European Union because um, basically European Union, um, the act that uh, the parliament made to join the European Union in 1970s could bind the uh, parliament of now. And actually um, it, it prevailed because EU law is uh, supreme, and even if the act for joining the EU was 
passed um, in 1970s, it could bind its, its uh, predecessors. So um, the ISIS Orthodox theory came into question, but after Brexit, uh, it, parliamentary sovereignty should be the same as before. Also, judicial review is a very important topic, and most of the times on exams and coursework, you get a question about this. Uh, you should read our notes here, and the main principles you should know about judicial review is that um, it's, it's a procedure in the UK that allows individuals to challenge decisions made by state, but not all decisions are subject to review. Mm so that it, it ensures accountability of executive power within constitution. So if there is, um, if there is a law that uh, you want, uh, you don't, you think is unfair, you could challenge it, but there, there is an, a doctrine called standing, which means that you cannot challenge any law you don't like, uh, that you have to have a standing for it. And uh, what, what actually standing means uh, it's, it's a, you should read our notes on it, and it's um, it's explained in detail what requirements are there for you to satisfy the requirements of standing and bring a claim of judicial review. Uh, but you should remember that judicial re review is usually the last resort. Only the decisions of public authorities are susceptible to the review. And finally, rule of law. Uh, there are three views concerning the rule of law, principle of legality, formal conception, and substantive conception. According to the principle of legality, if something is to be regarded as law, it must be enacted in whatever way the relevant legal system prescribes. Um, again, if we, uh, if we discuss the EU, um, there were some, for example, regulations were directly, um, directly applicable, whether or not Parliament enacted it or not. So that's why UK didn't actually want to be part of the EU, because there were EU, EU regulations that were directly um, applicable to the UK law, even if Parliament didn't want it. Uh, formal conception, the law should conform to standards designed to enable it uh, effectively to guide action. And substantive conception, supporters of this theory believe that the government must operate according to the law and that the law itself should have an inherent value. Uh, there are uh, academics that um, support each theory and if you get an essay question, um, usually rule of law and separation of power and all these topics come as essay question. And that's why you need to know all these theories and um, people who support these theories so that you have sufficient knowledge to discuss these theories, uh, analyze them and make arguments. So make sure that you review your past exam papers from your university, as well as our model essays and uh, practice answering essay questions using all these principles. Uh, finally, how did the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 had enhanced separation of powers in the UK? That's a typical question, essay question that you can get. Uh, on your exam and how you should answer it. Recommended structure would be, you need to introduce the topic. So explain this act, what are its main reforms without actually discussing it in detail, just the main reforms so that you start the discussion on how the 2005 act enhances separation of powers in the UK. And then you need to argue for and against the statement. Uh, and make sure that you use all the relevant case law for making arguments. Where do you find case law? You can find it on our website. We have all the main case law, um, case summaries that is actually a free resource that you can access. Um, and also you need to have a look at your, at, the, at your lecture slides and make sure that you mention all the cases that your course um, includes.
And in the conclusion, you need to sum up your main arguments and answer the question asked. Uh, this, we have a model uh, answer for this question that you can view on our website. And here we will only discuss the first part of it. First issue that we are discussing in this question is about reforming the Office of Lord Chancellor. That was the result of the 2005 Act. Introduce the issue. Seeking to uh, reduce the reliance on a single channel of the Chancellor as a constitutional hinge between the judiciary and the executive, the Act has established multiple channels to mediate and negotiate the relationship between the two branches. So here we all, we just introduced the issue of what happened about this, of how why the why the reform was necessary for the office of Lord Chancellor. And then uh, we explain the law. So in other words, who is Lord Chancellor and what are his duties? Um, a historic role of the Lord Chancellor, whose duties and titles were spread across each of the three branches of state, has long been seen as one of the most obvious and least justifiable overlaps of powers in the UK constitution. And then we have to analyze and refer back to the question, make sure that we um, show to the examiner that what we have discussed is relevant to the question asked and how is it relevant to the question asked. To address this issue, the Act removed Lord Chancellor's roles as a head of judiciary and substantially reduced the powers associated with the status. So this is the analysis of this is what happened and this is why it happened. And this, these are the results. And this is how this answers the question, basically. Um, however, paradoxically, many feared that this removal would only weaken judicial independence. For decades, the office of Lord Chancellor had been occupied by the very senior lawyers, respected by both politicians and the judiciary, and the posi position itself had been perceived as a being a successful legal or political career. Uh, and um, to continue the analysis after the changes brought around by the Act, it is very likely that the future occupants of the positions will be mid-career politicians from House of Commons, essentially seeking to make their way up the career ladder. Therefore, it is unrealistic to assume that they will confront cabinet members whose patronage they depend on in the same way as the previous Lord Chancellors did. This is why the establishment of multiple mediators between the branches is particularly important. So we explained in detail why was the, the, the reform necessary uh, and um, how did this affect, uh, how will, what effect will this have in the future? The full essay on this uh, question you can see on, on this link and it's highly recommended that you have a look at the full essay after the session. So to sum up, you need to analyze your exam requirements. It's the best thing you do. Do you have a coursework? Do you have an exam? If you have an exam, how many questions you are required to answer? And then you plan your studying accordingly. If it's a coursework, then what is what are the likely questions you are going to get by looking at the past exam papers? Uh, answer the, the practice to answer these past exam papers. And then make a list of selected topics that you're going to study for your assessment. After you study all the selected topics, you need to practice pro answering problem and essay questions on each topic. So for example, you study separation of powers, then you need to find a question on separation of powers, either from our model answers or from your past exam papers and answer it, draft an answer to it. And then there are two ways um, you can, if you draft an answer to our model question, then you can see our model answer and compare your answer to it. There is another way of um, sending your answer to your professor and trying to get some feedback from him or her. But most of the time, students tell us that the, the professors do not always answer their emails. 
if that's the case and you need to, some extra help other than our platform and our notes and content, um, you can actually get a tutoring session with us, a one-to-one -one Zoom call where we can review your answers and give uh, tailored feedback and guidance. Uh, and fourthly, and very important, is that you follow your professor's guidelines. Grading is subjective and every professor may tell you to answer the problem and essay questions slightly differently, even though there is um, a universal practice of doing this. So make sure that you get at least some feedback. Actually, there are formative coursebacks um, for most, that most of the universities have. It's something uh, voluntary, you don't have to do it, but it's highly recommended that you do it so that you get some feedback. And this way you can, you can at least understand better what you're required to do from your professor. So make sure that you have some feedback from your professor that you can work on. Then, um, how can we help? I understand that law is overwhelming. There's so much to learn. Our platform is designed to help you cope with that much work. We have simplified notes, um, model essays, tutorial videos, quizzes and flashcards, and study groups that you can join to interact with our community, ask questions, and so on. Our content is created by 10% of the law students who get high grades. The rest of the students get either 2 2 or drop out, unfortunately. And our, the ob whole objective of our platform is to change that. So, um, yeah, you can rely on our materials as well as your lectures. And um, as an additional resource, you can book tutoring sessions with us. If you book tutoring sessions with us, it's highly recommended that you do it as soon as possible and don't wait for the exam to come because uh, closer the exam is, you have lost less time to practice your legal writing skills. And this is not something you can learn in a day. It really requires time. It, it requires practicing. Uh, so if you book tutoring session a few months earlier than your exam, you have a lot more time to practice and improve your legal writing skills. Uh, you can see the reviews of um, our uh, past customers. Um, most 90% of our users get a first class. We would love you to be our next student to get high grades and you can join via this link and you can join our free study groups on WhatsApp here. Uh, thank you very much for attending this session.